Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello and welcome to AI Scouted on Anfield Index Pro. I'm Dave Hendrick, joined as always by Mr. Carl Matchett. How are you, sir? Not a lot better than last time we spoke. <laughs> we are recording the morning after Liverpool 2, Leicester 1 at Anfield. And while we did take the three points, it was an abomination of a performance. And, you know, we say things like a win is a win and a win is the most important thing. But, you know, even in a win, there are definitely things you need to be concerned by. And some of the performances that we witnessed last night are definitely things we need to be con- concerned by because they build bad habits. It's like when Lovren used to make 12 mistakes a game, but we'd win 3-2 or 3-1, and people would say, what are you moaning about? We won. And then the following week, we'd lose 1-0 because he'd make the same mistakes and we wouldn't be able to make up for it at the other end. Not every game is going to feature an opposition defender putting the ball through his own net in spectacular fashion twice. If we play like that against Brentford, the chances are that we will lose. And we play Brentford on Monday. They're coming off a confidence-boosting win over West Ham United, a 2-0 win away, which is a very, very good result for them, to be fair. And they're on a pretty good run in the Premier League right now. They drew at Wolves 1-1. Drew at Forest 2-2 away, which isn't a bad result away. They beat Manchester City 2-1 away. Now, those games did obviously take place before the World Cup. So there was a substantial break. But they drew 2-2 with Spurs and probably should have had that game dead and buried, considering they were two up on 56 minutes. And then the win last night. This Brentford team are pretty good, Carl. A fair assessment. Pretty good is what they are. Um, a top half team at the minute. Very congested sort of, well, below Liverpool basically is pretty congested all the way down to the bottom uh, in a couple of different chunks. But Brentford are pretty much the most consistent of them, which is saying something considering I think that they'd gone something like, I'm not sure if it was seven games with one win or something like that before they uh, beat West Ham last night. So, um they are good. They are a team which can cause real problems for even very good defences. They have a couple of routes to goal, let's say, which are really, really effective for them. Um, I think their left side is particularly excellent most of the time. And they have a couple of individuals who, against Liverpool, have caused us problems more than once. So it's not a game that you can be anything less than really, really up for if you want to take the victory. Um, you know, we've actually now just for the first time this season managed four wins in a row, which is pretty good, actually. Yeah. Um, but I can't honestly say that, well, neither of us think that we won in a manner which befits a team on a four game win streak last night. So it's it's got to be a step up in performance from us. Um, obviously, there's one or two injury issues for Brentford, which we'll get to in a minute. But even so, I think that we would need to go two levels up in midfield and defence if we're going to get the points from this match. Yes, I would very much agree with that. Now, we may have gotten a bit of a boost last night with Ivan Tony being stretchered off late mm. in the game. So it looks like he might miss out on Monday. There's been no real prognosis yet on what the injury is, but he looked in quite a bit of pain. I hope it's nothing serious. Yeah. Though, look, he's got a ban coming up in all likelihood for this this gambling shenanigans that he's been at. Um so maybe an injury <laughs> maybe an injury will be well timed. Maybe you can just go to the FA and say, look, just ban me for six months, nine months, however long. I'm out anyway. Um but yeah, he I mean he caused us so many problems last year. 
He absolutely battered Joel Matip last year. And they gave us a lot of trouble uh, in the game at their place. And they're like, there's a, there's a number of things to like about this team. They're a model club for starters. They they do things the right way. They make very, very smart decisions. They're really well coached. Thomas Frank is an excellent manager. And speaking of West Ham, who they defeated last night, if they were to make a decision to sack David Moyes, I think Thomas Frank should be very high on the list of people they should be looking at to come in and replace him. Um, the other team that are, you know, hovering about with West Ham outside the relegation zone are Everton. They should be sacking Frank Lampard as we speak to go and approach Thomas Frank. Now, it would be hopefully of more sense than to go there. But Thomas Frank, Carl, I, I think is a very, very good manager. I think he's absolutely capable of taking over a team with good financial backing and bringing some of the things he'll have picked up at Brentford, some of that smart decision making, and maybe help guide, you know, where the recruitment goes, and getting them potentially higher than Moyes did. Moyes got them, I think, sixth in one year. I think Thomas Frank's a better manager than Moyes, and maybe could raise that ceiling a little bit. Oh, possibly so. I mean, he obviously sees plenty more runway for Brentford to improve. He's just signed a new contract with them, um, so he's. You know, tied down, let's say, through to 2027, but obviously if a, another option comes along in the, in the intervening period, I'm sure there'd be plenty of discussions as to how high Brentford can go and how much backing he is exactly going to get. But he seems very, very happy there in terms of the setup being all geared towards his management style. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily get that everywhere you go, of course. So I don't doubt that he could go and coach at another club, let's say a bigger club in terms of stadium capacity and finances, but that smart thinking that you say, that that's a big thing for a manager. If you're getting in players who can take on board your better coaching, is that not a little bit better? And you could potentially go higher with less money than to a club who buy players for the sake of it at times, who buy players for positions rather than roles at times, who don't really have any seemingly joined up thinking from style or progression of style from one year to the next. Um, I think if he goes, or anybody else for that matter, goes to Everton or West Ham, it's kind of a broken system there, isn't it? Or there, or there isn't a system in Everton's case, and you kind of need sort of ground up building, or else a bit mm. of an overhaul at the top above the manager coming in. Um, yeah, which West, West Ham have, I think, given Moyes a little bit too much, a little bit too much reach. All that Ever- you understand that after what he did for them in the first. Yeah, of course, of course, yeah. but like Everton, Everton is a dumpster fire. They should avoid that job at all costs. That's a career killer, is Everton. <laughs> Are you that person who has everything? The coolest merch and those must-have fan threads? Well, over at our Anfield Index shop, we've gone that extra mile when it comes to pimping up your Liverpool collection. From our popular range of bespoke design t-shirts, sweaters, hoodies and hats, to our signature edition mugs, prints and coasters, all provided with fast worldwide shipping. We have something for every red. We also stock official LFC merchandise and are licensed with the Premier League and UEFA to sell official iron-on shirt badges and sleeve patches. As a listener to this podcast, you can get 10% off everything with coupon code AIPRO10. Just head over to AnfieldIndex.shop or find us on Etsy by searching for Anfield Index. I mean, it might be um, a career builder for for some young up-and-coming manager soon because he'll have to get them out of the championship if they don't uh, offload Mr. Lampard fairly soon, it would seem, given the recent form. But Brentford, look, I mean, right now with the rest of the clubs, let's say the, the bigger or more established Premier League clubs than Brentford, um, leave Everton West Ham out of them because they're like, you know, what is it, nearly 10 points between those sides at the minute and a lot of places. Aston Villa, you'd probably expect to push up the table in the second half of the campaign. Crystal Palace might be able to, but maybe around 10th, 11th is where they are this season anyway, because they've got quite a lot of injuries to cope with. I don't think Brentford will necessarily fear falling too far from where they are now. I mean, ninth is 
really good, really, really good for them. Mm. But if they finish, I, I would say anywhere from 12th upwards, that's that's an amazing season for them. Oh, yeah, especially in your second season in the division, yeah. because we've seen loads of teams come up, perform well in the first season, and then have that kind of collapse. And look, in truth, last season, we saw Brentford stroll into the Premier League, beat Arsenal on the mm-hmm. opening day, start the season quite well, but then go on a fairly disastrous run yeah. from the middle of October till the end of February. They only won three Premier League games against 15 defeats and two draws. And they looked like they were in serious trouble. They looked like they were heading back to the championship. But they turned things around. And from after they lost 2-0 away to, at home to Newcastle, rather, they won seven of their last 11 games and drew with Spurs and managed to end up finishing fairly comfortably in yeah. 13th. They were 11th going into the final day, and it was just that that last day defeat to Leeds um, with a very, very late Jack Harrison goal that, that saw them finish 13th. But to be able to turn around and, you know, improve on that has been has been impressive. And they went out in the summer, and I think they made some very smart buys, but I would argue that of the players they paid money for, none of them have fully worked out yet. They brought in Aaron Hickey. He's been quite good, but they have been playing him right back. He is predominantly a left back, and he's now injured. So that's why I would say hasn't fully worked out yet. They brought in Keen Lewis Potter from Hull, who's a very talented player, was linked to a number of Premier League clubs, and they actually nicked him from under the noses of the Ev. Um, he hasn't he hasn't established himself yet, but he's a young player coming up from the championship. So he's a long term investment. And Mikkel Damsgaard has probably been the most disappointing of them. Mm. But we know there's a good player there. We've seen it for Sampdoria. We've seen it for the national team. And it may just take him a year to settle into the Premier League. And that's fine. That's fine when the team is mid-table. But they brought in Ben Mee on a free. Very clever signing. He's been quite good for them. And they brought in Strakosha, who, again, hasn't worked out. But he hasn't been given many opportunities yet. He may still get a chance at some point. Like, these these were good signings that they made. These weren't... These were big risks. These were calculated signings. And I can see Hickey coming back doing very well. I think Lewis Potter will do well. And I think Damsgaard will do well once they get, you know, a little bit more time in the Thomas Frank system, a little bit more familiarity with each other and with the team and with what the expectations are. Like... uh, I thought that was a clever summer that they had, and they didn't they didn't lose any of their kind of star names other than Ericsson, who, if we remember, they'd really kind of taken a flyer on. Mm. He he wasn't a player that they had had long term. He was a player that nobody else was really willing to take a risk on. Yeah. They took the risk and they got the reward. He he was very, very good for them. So they lose him, but they managed to hold on to pretty much everybody else. Yeah, I mean, like even the, the players that you mentioned that they paid fees for, 20, 21, and 22 years of age, you know, that's not a problem. Yeah, long-term signings. Yeah, um, there's, a, there's a good opportunity for progression with at least a couple of those players. And, you know, Hickey has played a good bit already, not loads and loads and not a guaranteed starter. But again, you look at someone like Rico Henry, he's not going to be walked out of the team. I think he's one of their best performers this season again. So it's not a problem if they don't come straight in and, you know, being nine out of ten, there's also obviously been a couple of um, formation shifts for them this season. They started off trying to go back to the back four. It's been the back three again since the restart. So there's there's plenty to work with still. Um, I do think that it's still a little bit uh, contingent, their results or their performance level on about three players being very, very good. Um, I think Norgard's a really important player for them at the base of that midfield. Yeah. Uh, obviously, Ivan Tony up front is not just his goals; it's the hold-up play, the link work, the channel running, the the pain in the ass and necessity of him. Um, he's just a very, very good forward for them. And obviously, systemically, they have players who fit. This is, I think, 
above everything else for Brentford, the thing that works for them. I'm actually a little bit surprised that Ben Mee has been as good as he is because I thought him coming in and the back three, he would be best off in the middle of it or in a two. But actually left of centre, I think he's been better than I expected him to be, to be fair, um, considering not like huge volumes of pace. And I wouldn't say he's the most comfortable in sort of channel or wider areas. I actually think he's done really well there. He is liberated, Cal, having mm. spent so long at Burnley. He has been, he's seeing... He's seen wide open patches of grass for the first time in his career and he, he's embracing it. But the other thing with those young players they brought in, like they didn't bring them in just for this season. No. Hickey's contract till 2026, Stamsgaard till 2027 and Lewis Potter till 2028. Those are long-term investments. But, you know, you look through the squad and you've got David Rea, the starting goalkeeper, 26 years of age. So he's probably another year away from entering his prime as a goalkeeper. Now, I'm not a huge David Rea fan, I have to say, um, but he he has been good for them this season. And with him and Strakosha, that's a pretty good goalkeeping situation. You mentioned Rico Henry. They've got him at 25 years of age, tied down till 2027, including a club option year. He's, I think, one of the better left backs in the league. I do like Christopher Ayer at centre-back, and again, 24, tied down till 2026, but... He has had a number of injuries since joining, and that's a little bit of a concern. I'm not overly sold on the rest of the centre-backs. Like, I think Ethan Pinnock is a solid citizen, but I think he might just be a championship-level player. I kind of th- think the same about Pontus Janssen, and they're that little bit older, so I think next summer's work will be you know, replacing them or finding successors to them, because... They're that little bit older. Um, I don't mind Pinnock, I must say. He is, he's, like you say, he's a bit like a do the exact job we're asking of you, but I think mm. he does quite well, to be fair. I think he's he's very reliable. He's not only capable of doing one job and relatively shit at it. He is actually pretty good at that. Central oh, yeah, role. he's good. He's good at the at, at his specific role. Yeah. But if he's asked to play outside of that, that's where you get some struggles. I, you know, Charlie Good's not a not a particularly good Premier League level defender. Matthias Jorgensen, Zanka is he's oh, old no. and reliable. You know, he heads it and he kicks it and he doesn't do fuck all else. Um, there is of course Mads Rorslev, the back of right back, who we've spoken about before. We won't bully on this podcast, but you know, it's a decent enough group of defensive players. Next summer, they just need to add one or two more centre backs. I think they're in good nick. Midfield, they've got loads of really good options. Norgard, I think, is excellent. They've got him tied down until 2026. Matthias Jensen, I'm a big fan of. 2024, he's only 26 years of age. Josh De Silva, who, I don't know if you saw his goal last night, Carl, but I didn't know he had that kind of burst of pace in him. I knew he was a talented player, but that burst of pace was really impressive. He's tied to 2024, so they'll probably look to extend him. He's only 23. Uh, Goldust is a solid squad option Onyeka they bought last summer he's a talented player powerful midfielder can do a lot of things for you Damsgaard we've mentioned Baptiste another younger player 24 will run all day for you Vitaly Janot we've talked about him plenty 24 tied down till 2026 really talented player Mads, Mads Bistrup, he's out on loan, but he's another good young player. Um, and in attack, you've got Sergi Canos, I think is a little bit out of his depth in the Premier League, but he can do a job for you in a few different places. I like Johan Wiese, and I think he's proven a very good bench option for them. He's 25, tied down to 2026. They've got Tony, Brian and Bomo, 23, tied down to 2027. We see flashes of the talent. He's clearly got a lot about his game. If he could find consistency, I think there's a hell of a player there. And then, you know, you've got Lewis Potter, like I said, 2028 with a club option. So they got, they got him on a six year deal with an option for a seventh. And then they've got a couple of other young players that are, you know, filling out the squad, but all things considered, you know, you look at that squad and think, there's one or two that might get nicked. Like Ivan Tony, I think, ban depending, this is probably his last year with them. But he would bring in big, big money for them. Mm. 
and th they could potentially turn that money into his replacement and the centre back that they need, and then they'll have a budget of money aside anyway to invest in whatever else they want. I think the important thing with Brentford is, especially this club, is that if Tony is to go, they will already have a list of about six players who they think are exactly like him or can be exactly the same mm. as him in the next two years, and they'll know exactly who they want to buy, and they'll probably get them for like 20% of what they sell Tony for, something like that. Um, it's a very, very good network that they have, a very, very diligent um, approach to all deals that they make, really. And like you say, it's a, it's very much a, a long-term core of the squad there if they want to keep them. Um, and none are really on that big wages. I've not actually seen anything of what Damsgaard got coming in, but the rest of them are not on like hilariously outlandish or unsustainable salaries. So again, very, very good team building, which again comes back to Thomas Frank that we started talking about. You know, I think that's tactically, obviously, he's very good. And technically, he likes his players to to perform well and to express themselves. But I, again, think that team building is one of the best aspects of his job that he has shown with this club. Yeah, I agree with that. I think I, when you watch them play, like they really do play for each other and they play for him. And there's a, there's like a nonstop drive in that team where even when they go behind, they don't just give up. They don't let their heads drop. They know what's expected of them, and they seem to have a good a good level of confidence in their own abilities as well. Like there's never been a moment where I've watched Brentford and thought, "Oh, they've got a little bit of imposter syndrome." You know the way sometimes you see teams come up from the championship, and they they kind of seem like they've already accepted their fate and they're only there to make up the numbers. And if they can get a decent result, fair enough. Like I've seen this a couple of times with Norwich where it looks like their heads go a little bit and they they kind of feel like, oh, yeah, we're, you know, we're not quite good enough to be at this level. Whereas, like I said, Brentford walked in day one, slapped the shit out of Arsenal, and we're like, yeah, we're here. And we're not going anywhere. We're here to stay now. If Brighton can do it, we can do it. And they've got a very similar model to Brighton, and obviously their owner comes with a very similar background to Brighton. And they take that really measured, really in-depth approach to recruitment. And in Thomas Frank, like you said, they've got a manager that can knit all of it together. Which makes our task somewhat difficult, given um, recent showings, let's say. And I think I would prefer to see a bit of a change of system as a result in midfield here for us. Yeah. I think Jurgen has to bite the bullet and make some difficult decisions because let's let's start with let's start with the defense. Okay, Ali is obviously the best in the world. He's fine. You don't mess with him. I think he's got. Uh, I thought Joel had a decent game. And you said on Raw that you disagreed. And then I, when I did my uh, kind of ra rating, new, my new rating system on Twitter, um, a lot of people agreed with you that Joel did not have a good game. And Guy is agreeing with you as well. He didn't think he had a good game. So I watched chunks of the game kind of last night when I was lying in bed on my phone. And he was a bit poor. And I thought he was poor against Villa as well. I thought Ollie Watkins gave him a bit of a roasting and he was at fault for their goal. He was just completely flat-footed. I think Ibu has to come back in regardless of Ivan Tony. If Ivan Tony was definitely playing, I'd be demanding Ibu, but I think Ibu has to start anyway. Yeah. Um, I think he will come back in, assuming you know fitness levels and everything else, but... I'd probably even be putting in Joe Gomez if he wasn't available, if Kanati's not available, actually. I, I, do, I do think that uh, Matip's not been at the level, certainly on a consistent enough basis. Um, I don't like, imagine that there'll be any issue with Kanati at all. And you know, it's enough time past the World Cup final and recovery and back in training and all the rest of it now so that he can come in. Guy is calling for Nat Phillips to start, which we're just going to breeze past and ignore completely. Um but I think, yeah, I think I would even put Gomez in. He's had a couple of outings off the bench, obviously. Nothing drastic, good or bad either way. So 
we need to make some hard calls at the minute because we yeah. cannot afford to keep dropping ground. We we need to keep doing the other thing, obviously, actually actively make up grounds. Now, I mentioned last night, obviously, on, on Raw, that with the win, we were two points behind Spurs, who were fourth. We've now played the same amount of games as them. Oh, it's a very, very difficult thing to explain, considering how inconsistent and how poor we've been for a long time. Spurs play Villa on New Year's Day. Mm. That's that's their this fixture as such. So before we play Brentford, we we could be you know um, back to having a bit of a gap between us. There is all the, also uh, United in between us, but we're just going to completely ignore them for now until we actually have to worry about them. I think so. I, I think this is a very very difficult game for Liverpool to get three points from anyway. But if we don't make a few alterations, I don't see us winning this match even closely. To be honest. Yeah, see, I'm very much of the same thought process that because they're really well coached and really well drilled and they play as a, as a team rather than a collective of individuals, which is, I, I think Villa, I don't think Villa were built the right way. They were built by Dean Smith and Gerard, and Gerard took a quite a strange approach to how he recruited players. And Dean Smith took a, a bad approach to how he recruited players and bought quite a lot of draws. Now, there's a good team at Villa. And I think when Emery gets, you know, a bit more time and a bit of, a few players of his own in, I think he will put a decent team in place. But they have serious flaws. Leicester... I mean, Brendan Rodgers is, is as bad as bad as it comes when it comes to recruitment. He's, he's an idiot. And it's quite clear that the players are not fully committed to him. They've also got a number of players on short contracts, like Tielemans has six months left. I think Pryat has six months left. Madison and Didi, I know Madison didn't play last night, but Madison and, and Didi have 18 months left. There's others in the squad that are out of contract this summer, next summer. Like it, it feels like that Leicester group is very much coming to the end of their cycle and needs to be blown up and started over at, with a different manager. Whereas, you know, with, with Brentford, Thomas Frank has built this team. This wasn't built by anybody else. This was built by him. This is his work with the recruitment team. Players recruited to his demands, his requirements. Players brought in and in you know eased into their culture their style of play worked on for their specific roles nobody being asked to do something different to what they were bought for so they're just they're just a much slicker operation than the other two they're better coached than the other two have been and like I say, yeah, they were just they were built for purpose. That's just a bit of a players thrown in here, there, and everywhere. And and Villa, like I said, when the Gerrard recruitment was was largely very poor, and Emery will have to will have to dig that out. Brentford, even without a couple of players, they still play the same way. They still do fundamentally the same things. There's the odd tweak, like when Tony's not been there before. They've just changed how they how they structure their attack ever so slightly, but it's not like they've done it on the fly. It's something they've clearly worked on. It's something Thomas Frank has clearly spent time on. You know, this is these are our normal patterns of play. But Ivan, go sit down for twenty minutes. This is what we're going to do when he's not there. So the players already know how to adapt to not having Ivan Tony. And that makes them much more difficult to play against than other teams that seem to do things on the fly. Hello, I'm here to annoy you. I'm here to annoy you into listening to more of me and more of others on EPL Index. We don't just have the Anfield Index stuff. We've got EPL Index as well, which covers the entirety of the Premier League. And we have three podcasts and a whole bunch of really good writing on EPLindex.com. The podcasts are my own two-footed podcast, which is every day at 4 p.m., Monday through Friday, covering the whole league. We have a tad predictable, hosted by Tadiwa. You know Tadiwa, he does Anfield Index. 
he presents a tad predictable before every Premier League match week. And then Kevin DeVries and his crew on the EPL roundtable there every week after the Premier League match week. So make sure you listen to everything we're doing on EPL Index and follow us there on Twitter at EPL Index. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like even to an extent if it's Wissa who comes in, for example, it's it's still a very difficult thing to deal with because he's nonstop runs in behind. He's really, really quick. Um, his combination play, I think, is actually pretty good. He just doesn't do it all the time. He's a little bit more individualistic than the other two, I'd say. But his dribbling is very good, close control, really good at getting away from the first challenge and then into space. So that combined with the fact that Liverpool are rubbish at tracking runners from deep and Brentford love having runners from deep from a yeah. proper three-man midfield, these are real difficult things for Liverpool to deal with. So again, for me, it is Kanati to come in, but I would also go to a, a double pivot midfield for this one. I really would. And either play, if you want to play two up top, fine, but if not one uh, in behind who can drop in like a proper number, a proper number 10 and attacking midfielder rather than two forwards. Like I think we need the balance of the three midfielders at times, but if not, then a very narrow four. I think you go narrow four and two up front. Yeah. Um, I'm fine with that just because there has been really good signs of the, the link up between Darwin and Salah. Yeah. And I don't want to break that up, but I don't want to no. mess with that. So I would start the two of them up front. Now, Look, this is just what I would do, and this is not what Jurgen will do, and I'm not expecting him to do it, but I, I would like to I would really like to see this this put together just for one game. I'd like to see Gomez at right back, Ibu, Virgil, and Costas, I think, because Robbo went off injured. Yeah. And wasn't particularly good anyway. He was injured I, in the warm up, apparently. That's that's part of the reason what why. What the fuck did he play then? I don't know. Like, what are we That's doing what, here? what the injury was, so. If there's any risk, he shouldn't play. He's a player that relies heavily on being at full capacity. Um, I'd like to see Trent play on the right of midfield. Narrow, tucked in, but able to break wide. He'd be play, playing in the same area as he plays in any way on the ball. It's just that he left Joe Gomez behind him for a bit of cover. Now, I will say, I thought Trent defended really well against Leicester. Yeah. Like, really well. I thought he marked Harvey Barnes out of the game. Fab and Thiago, Darwin and Moe. And I would start Harvey Elliott on the left of midfield. And on 60, I'd bring on Cody Gakpo. Because I assume he'll be registered today. Not today, tomorrow, New Year's Day. Thank God, let be the second. No, 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 no. The Premier League are accepting registrations tomorrow. You know. So they're accepting registrations tomorrow. So we can register him and Wolves can register Matthias Cunha. So they'll be fine then to play on the second. So I would like to see Elliot start and Gakpo come on. I just think with Harvey... I think you need to simplify his game a little bit. I think he's getting a little bit too lost during games. And I think if it's a simple enough role of off the ball, you just sit in front of that fullback and don't let runners get at him. On the ball, just get high and swing crosses in. Don't try and do too much. Don't take too much out of the ball. Don't try and do it all yourself. Now, like I say, I don't think Klopp will do this, but I'd really like to see what Trent would look like on the right of a midfield four. My ex expectation, obviously, is that Trent starts right back next to Ibu, Virgil, and Costas, and that he goes with something in midfield. Now, if it is Trent at right back, I'd like to see Ox played in front of him. Now, I know Ox didn't play well against Leicester. That's fine. But I'd like to see him try it on the right. I'd like to see him get an opportunity on the right and still go with Harvey on the left and bring Gakpo on and go with Fab and Thiago as a double pivot. Um, I'd be up for Ox on the left. Uh, sorry, on the right. Um, three starts in a row. I don't, I don't know when the last time he made three consecutive league uh, starts for us would be, but I'm guessing a while. Um, how do you think he's done out so far? Like in terms of staying in the team, I don't think, I don't think we can say he's been good enough for that. If you know people were available, let's say. No, he hasn't. But, but 
taking into the context of where he was prior to this last couple of starts and how much he's played and what the team is doing right now, importantly, context of where Liverpool as a team are right now, how has he done in terms of that for you? I think when he's been able to get on the ball and get involved, he's done quite well. I just don't think he's gotten on the ball nearly enough in the last couple of games. But, I mean, he's played some really nice passes to Darwin in both games. I would just... He just seems a little bit lost playing wide on the left. Like, it just it's almost like the game is going on and he's he's the referee or something and he's running along with the game but his teammates aren't finding him or he's not demanding enough of the ball but like I say the odd time he gets on the ball and he gets his head up and he has a look I thought against City when he came on he made one great pass and had some really powerful runs at the heart of their defence I thought the same against Villa a couple of good passes a couple of good runs with the ball and the same last night, not so much with the runs, but I did think he played a couple of good passes last night. There was a spell in the, in the first half where he got on the ball twice in like 30 seconds and drove in inside of um, Castagna, drove in at a Marty, and then seemed to hesitate on what to do next. And once he slipped, and then the second one he played quite a weak pass. And like... He's played so little football in the last year. In the last the last year. He's played so little football in the last couple of years that I do just wonder if he's sort of still searching for rhythm and maybe a bit of acceptance from his teammates. Like, there's definitely a thing with players where if someone's been fit but they're left out in the cold for a long time, the players kind of look at them and go, the manager doesn't think much of you. So why should I? You know, we might like you as a person, but, you know, you're clearly not in the plans here. And I I do wonder if maybe Ox is searching for a little bit of validation from his teammates and maybe he needs one or two big moments in a game for him to get, get the belief that others believe in him and for the others to look and go, do you know what? He's making big differences. Let's get him more of the ball. Let's start feeding him because he's having real joy here against Villa. There was a couple of moments where he had some real joy and then he wouldn't touch the ball for like 10 more minutes. Mm. Do you know? So I I think he's done okay. I don't think he's been bad. I think he's been a bit of a passenger though. Yeah. I, I think somewhere along the same lines, like I don't think he has been the biggest problem that we've had in the last couple of games. I don't think he's done enough to warrant has to be in the lineup. Like, I don't think it would be a huge surprise if he didn't start this game, let's put it that way. But I don't think he's done a terrible job. I think he's done, a, in fact, in terms of the job that he's needed to do off the ball, I think he's done all right on that. There's definitely been effort and endeavour, and he probably already knows going into the game that it's going to be about the 60-minute mark that he gets. So he's able to put a little bit more in sort of first half and that. Um, I, I, wouldn't be open, I wouldn't be against seeing him start again, especially if it is right side this time. I don't think that he's I don't think his best traits really are to sort of cut in and curl across or shoot or anything like that. He's not a wide forward or an inside forward as such. He is much more of a bursting midfielder from deep. Mm. So perhaps that allows him to be a little bit more in tune of what he, he is very, very good at doing. And and if you play him on the right, he can tuck in and form that midfield well. three. Yeah, and he is a good crosser as well, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I, I I think it's quite important we play the double pivot of Fabinho and Thiago if they're both available. Again, with Thiago, you've got the three starts in succession sort of question, but mm. our, our, our games have been relatively spread out, though. You know, it's it's one fixture fewer in this time of year than it would have been normally. Um, so, you know, 26th, 30th, and then the second is not awful for Fabinho. That's, what is it, seven, eight days, something like that, all told. Uh, sorry for Thiago, not for Vigna. Um, and then we've got Wolves in the cup after that, so he can. And you, you, know, you can let him. Minutes. Yeah, you're not going to play him in that game. No. And you really shouldn't be playing anybody of real importance in that game. The next important game is the 14th of January at at Brighton. That's the the next game for Thiago. That's the next game for Virgil and and anyone who's 
seen as an automatic starter should not be playing until then. Klopp needs to bin the FA Cup off. I know he won it last year and he might want to try and make an effort to, you know, retain it, but fuck it. Like, just focus on the league, focus on the Champions League. You've got Real coming up in February and you've got a bunch of important Premier League games before that. Take advantage of that 12-day break between Brentford and Brighton and let those players get a bit of rest. The, the, this Wolves game in the cup is like the last chance of a rest of quite a while. Like, yeah, it's, it's all big games after that. Like, Brighton away is really difficult. Chelsea is the next one. Wolves away will be hard because Lopetegui will have them more or less set up well by then. Then it's the Derby. Then it's Newcastle away who are flying. Then it's Real Madrid. Like, we're we're not we're not set for another break for any of our key players for a while. Like, no, so I think we have to go kind of all in on trying to get three points from this Brentford match. And then, like you say, it all change basically for Wolves. Give them twelve day break. Come but if you lose top, that, you if you get if you points. get yourself out of the FA Cup, even though those are big games, it's one a week. Brighton on the fourteenth, Chelsea on the twenty first. It's actually nearly a week and a half until Wolves. Then it's a week until Everton. Mm. Then it's a week until Newcastle. And then, like you said, it's Real Madrid. Crystal Palace, but then a week until United, because there is that big gap from the 21st of November to the 15th of March between the Real games. Yeah, we still have one to fit in as well along the way. We do, but you know who who that's that's Chelsea again. Yeah. Um. So that, that's going to have to go in there somewhere in the midweek. But you know, if you get knocked out of the FA Cup, then that's great. We, we'll have. We'll have weeks where the players can rest and then, you know, they'll be ready to go. And <clears throat> I suppose the other option in midfield, if he wants to just go with a three, is to start Keita, who I didn't think did all that well last night. But again, a lot of people said they thought he was quite good and he was progressive and, and he was. And he, he did definitely try and make some things happen. I thought when he got marooned out on the left wing, he looked a little bit lost. But, you know, he's he's fit again. And he's kind of in the same boat with Ox, where he's almost certainly leaving in the summer. And you'd probably rather not have to play players that might be holding off a little bit to not get injured while they're trying to sort a big money move somewhere else. But you could definitely play Naby and play him on the right side of the midfield three. And I'd still play Harvey on the left because I'd still go with a three, a left winger and two up front and leave Mo nice and narrow next to Darwin and just say to Naby, when we lose the ball, just shuttle out to the right hand side and just sit in front of Trent and give him a bit of protection there. Um but one thing that can't happen is is the captain can't play. I don't need a VPN. I've got nothing to hide. <laughs> this is what I used to tell myself before I hooked up with LibertyShield.com. Not only is my home internet now fully encrypted, but I can now access all the websites I want, whenever I want, and do so from absolutely anywhere. As a Liverpool fan... I love to know I can now watch every match, regardless of whether it's on UK TV or not. My Liberty Shield VPN makes sure nothing is blocked and guarantees me super fast streaming speed throughout that match. You can get connected right now with their software package, which includes a 48 hour no obligation free trial and instant access to their apps for Apple, Android, Fire TV, PC, Mac, and Android TV. Or, Go a step further like I have and get one of their pre-configured VPN routers. These small but powerful devices allow you to easily connect every device in your home to VPN, making it the perfect solution for smart TVs, mag boxes and games consoles. Visit libertyshield.com today and use coupon code AIVPN25 to get 25% off at checkout. He cannot be rewarded for that performance against Leicester with another start. That was, it was pathetic. And he has to be dropped for this game. And not rested. He needs to be told, I'm dropping you. You need to get your shit together. Do you think that that will happen? Klopp doesn't have the balls to do it. Because he knows what will happen. The other fellow will have a tantrum. Because it's what he always does. 
So he'll just he'll if he does leave him out, he'll leave him out. He'll convince him it's for rest because he played the last two games, and he came back early from the World Cup and played a part against City. So he'll make it out that it's rest, but he needs to be dropped. There can't be one rule for everybody else and another rule for him. He's not good. He's never been great. He doesn't warrant special treatment just because he has tantrums and runs to his pals in the press and leaks stuff whenever things don't go his way. I don't know. I mean, I think, again, it's a little bit tricky because we don't definitely, we don't definitively know that Fabinho is going to be back and available. We assume he will be because it's, you know, what, three, three days afterwards, but you can never tell what's going to happen in that situation. I'd, I'd play Basetic over him. That's the other thing I was going to say. I think the only way that really I would want Henderson in this is, is if it is a narrow four that we play him on the right hand side. That's that's the only real position I would put him in for this game if it's that system. I mean, he did he did okay there against Villa for after the first ten to fifteen minutes, which were poor. He had a good run until half time and then probably a good five minutes after half time and then he he was he was shot and he was useless and the substitution came about ten minutes too late but um I I'd be honest, I really struggle to see that we have enough aggression and power and running to win this game if we have Ox and Cater starting. I really do. At the minute I don't see either of them as physically capable. Is he physically capable though? No. Is anybody uh, like what, um, what? What aggression and power do we have in midfield? In the middle, nothing. Nothing. This is the big mm. problem, though. Yeah. Like, yeah, but I think uh, I, I think it only has to be one of those two. Even even <laughs> even though you bring in Abi Ali, let's say. It's oh, I wouldn't start Ox and and Naby. Oh yeah. no, no, it'd be one or the other. It, right. it couldn't be both for me. And I know, like Harvey's got about as much power as a wet fart, but at least he has. He fights. He fights, and he's, he's strong he's doing it, yeah. this. Harvey, the one thing we know about Harvey is he is fully committed. He is, fu- and I'm not saying the others aren't, Ox and Nabi. I'm not saying they aren't, but in the back of their minds, it has to be prevalent that my contract's up in the summer. I'm probably not here next season, which means that for the next six months, I'm playing for a move but I don't want to get injured because that makes makes it much harder to find a good club. That's fair. And even if it's not the move which is in the back of their minds, the injuries will be. Yeah. That's, you know, that's an unavoidable part. They both missed half a season. Yeah. yeah. Do you know? So... It's a, I, tricky, it's a tricky lineup for Liverpool. I think what the first thing we have to do is get the defence far more aligned with each other. Canate's got to be in for the individual level. Mm. Um, I would I would play Trent right back just because he was much more diligent uh, defensively in the last game, and hopefully we keep that going. Simicus probably has to play, so there's your back five with the keeper. And if you've got Salah and Nunez playing well, you've just just got to put something together in midfield which can stop them doing what they do best, which is the runs from Vidal Janelt, which is the wing backs getting forward into decent areas. Actually, do you know what? We've we've said about Borosled before, and you're right, we're not gonna have a go at him. Actually, the last couple of games he's played well, which is mildly concerning. He's for, learned how to control the football, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> he's actually been really decent in their build-up play. So um let's put an end to that. Costas, this is your time to shine. Um yeah, I, 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 I was really confident we were going to put in a good performance and smash Leicester all over the place, and we were rubbish. We were really, really poor. I was so disappointed with our performance last night. Could he consider a back three? I don't think this is the time to do that, no. I mean, he could. He always could, but I, I wouldn't do it personally. Just thinking with the distinct lack of midfield options, a Gomez, Canate, Virgil back three pushing Trent and Costas on mm. and then having that double pivot in midfield and maybe sticking, maybe going with Naby, Fab and Thiago as a three and just playing Darwin and Mo up front. 
I mean, it works in terms of a lineup. I, I don't envisage. I don't think he'll do it. I don't think he'll do it. No. Is there is there scope? Is there need to potentially just say to Cody Gakpo, I, I know you're only in the door, but get your boots on, son. You're starting. I wouldn't start him now. I think that's just asking for trouble one way or another. It's asking for too much expectation. It's asking for someone like Oxley Chamberlain to be reduced to absolute rubble in terms of confidence and self-belief and that, because he'd just be thinking, well, that's me done, isn't it, for the season? Um, no, I think that's that's silly. I think. But could you, you know, start? Could you move Ox to the right and play Gakpo on the left? <laughs> And just say to Naby, it's like you could say to Harvey, you've played quite a bit recently. You're going to get a break. You got a couple of a couple of big knocks in the Leicester game, so you're we're going to hold you back. Uh, Jordan, you you've played loads, and we know you're a you know fragile soul, but we're going to leave you out of this one. Naby, you're coming on on sixty for Thiago. Ox, you'll start right wing. Cody yeah, will start absolutely. left wing. You could. You really could. And maybe we will. It, maybe it'll be a proper 4-3-3 and he starts left wing with Oxley Chamberlain, the right side at eight, let's say. Mm. I wouldn't. I'd be, I'm would be. i still a little bit reluctant to do that, to be honest. Um, maybe just the, the, the lack of intuitiveness and understanding that we would have down that entire flank with the backup left back, Thiago, who has had to do more than one job, and then a left winger who's never played for us, I think it'd just be asking for trouble against a team as well set up and as mm. fully understanding as this Brentford side are. I think we'd get torn apart. Their there. right side is less threatening than their left side, though. It is, but it still does a very, very good job. Even if it is just about winning the ball, setting the position and switching play, it still yeah. does a really good job. And we would so struggle to deal with that, I think. Yeah. There isn't really a good <laughs> there isn't really a good option here, Carl. No, no, there's not. No, there's not. This this is absolutely where we put ourselves now. And that's why yeah. I say I think it has to be about going to a bit of a change of shape and just try and hold position there in midfield. Stop them making the runs and stop them doing what they do. And if we need to change all four starting midfielders to keep the energy and the power there, well, use your subs. You've got enough to do it. That's honestly that's where I am with this midfield right at the moment. I'd start Ox right, Fabinho and Thiago, and then I honestly I didn't even want to start Harvey Elliott, and I'm looking through our squads for who else can we start instead of him, and I'm not coming up with any really really ben good Dolan. ideas. Left wing, just tell him get the ball and run, son. Just go and run at them. Don't worry about anything else. You just knock the ball past them, and you run as fast as your little legs will carry you down that line. I mean, I I would. I think overall go with Harvey Elliott left side and maybe even then during the game swap over Ox and Elliott so that they're both tucking infield onto their natural foot because we want that narrow midfield and just see how they do either side of the pitch. But whichever way around it is, I think a, a narrow, very hard working, very shuttling four is probably how I would set up for this. And I don't know, just hope that they can, you know, produce enough moments of, of combination play. But most of all, be aggressive against this big, giant, well thought out, really well arranged team who run because we're going to get run off the park here otherwise. Yeah. Um, just to just to run down the injuries uh, for Brentford, Baptiste is out. Ayer is expected to miss this one. Hickey's expected to miss this one. Onyeka should be back. And Strakosha, they think, should be back as well. Uh, Ivan Tony remains. Remains to be seen. For us, no Diaz, no Artur. Christ, we could do with a little bit of Artur right now, just to have a different option in midfield. Um, No Jota, no Curtis Jones, no Bobby Firmino, no James Milner. Um, Fabinho should be good to go. But Robbo and Harvey picked up Knox last night. So Harvey might not even be available for this game. Yeah, true. And then obviously Gakbo is a doubt because he's he's only just arrived and with a bit of training. Um I will see. We'll see. If he was available, I'd say Curtis Jones for this kind of game as one of those tucked in. That's that's the kind of game that I would think he would play. I'd well start on. him on the right in front of I wouldn't start him on the left. I'd start him on the right in front of Trent in a four four two. Yeah. And just tuck him in and tell him, be careful with the ball. 
don't do anything stupid. Be diligent. Stop those runners. If you see, if you see a runner from midfield, if you see Mads Rorslev decide to break into a jog, you track him. <laughs> um, yeah, or, or Vitaly Arnold, I meant, sorry, not Mads Rorslev. Um, yeah, I'm not confident at all going into this game. I was, I, I was before. Before last night's game, I thought these are definitely games, two games we can win. As good as as good as I do think Brentford are and as well coached they are, I I do think this was a game that we you know should be going into confident. But last night was just we were so 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 poor that I just I don't have confidence for this one, Carl. And I'm gonna predict a draw. I'm gonna go one one. Well, I've been handed a several match ban actually by one of our listeners, Lisa Marie. Um, yeah, after your five nil prediction. So yeah. I'm actually not allowed to predict a scoreline today, but I am going to say we will not win this game. Now, what I will say is that that is not the end of the world because we're not going for the title this year. We haven't got to worry about winning every single match relentlessly. We have to worry about matching and keeping pace with United and Spurs at the moment. And across these three games, basically, between the restart and the FA Cup, if we can match or pull back a point or two on them, that's all right. You know, it's not it's not amazing, but we're not in an amazing spot right now, and you kind of have to roll with what, we, what you've got. So if we manage to get in a midfielder in January, uh, if we manage to integrate Cody Gakpo, if we get Firmino and somebody back from injury, and we close the gap a little bit, I'll take that, I think, given how many games are still left and the fact that I still think we're better teams than than those two. Um, I, I will probably take that. So not the be-all and end-all to take the three points in this exact context, but I'm hoping for something a lot more in terms of the performance than we saw at home to Leicester. Mm. So just to be clear, um, in the three games, obviously, we beat Villa, Spurs drew with Brentford and United beat an awful Nottingham Forest team. Uh, we have played Leicester. United play Wolves in exactly one hour from now. And then tomorrow, Tottenham are at home to Aston Villa. And as we know, Unai Emery does not do away wins. So you'd probably expect Spurs to win. But I think that game for United is going to be quite tough for them. Um in the next round, then, obviously, we, we play Brentford on Monday. On the Tuesday, United play Bournemouth. And on the Wednesday, Tottenham are away to Palace, which will be a tough enough game. Yeah. So you could see Tottenham take five points from the three games. We've taken six. If we get a draw against Bournemouth, that'll be seven. And I don't know that I fancy United to beat Wolves, but I think yeah. they'll beat Bournemouth. So that could be, say, seven points for them as well. So, like you said, we'll have matched them across the um, across the three games. We'll be a little bit behind them. Uh, we'd be, I would suggest, five points behind Spurs, but with the game less played. And we would have the same amount of games played as United but we would be four points four points behind them, yeah. yeah. And you'd fancy us to chase them down over 21 games. You absolutely would. But uh, our midfield needs to be addressed this month, and I'm going to keep saying it from now until the 31st of January. I'm going to keep saying it. Every podcast I do, I'm going to say, I don't care if people get annoyed. It needs to be addressed. It's not acceptable. If Paul Joyce is right and we don't do anything else between now and the end of January, that is an absolute disgrace because our midfield is screaming out for help. We've got Thiago and Fabinho are the only ones good enough to be starting in midfield, good enough and reliable enough to be starting in midfield. And both of them come with some injury issues. Naby has too many injury issues. Ox has too many injury issues. Henderson is finished. Milner's finished. Jones has proven nothing to suggest he's good enough to start regularly. 
Elliot's not a midfielder, Carvalho's not a midfielder, and Basetic is a child. These are not midfield options. We need to get some in the door. What do you want to tell the people before we go? Do you have anything that you want to plug? Uh, just the same two pieces as I mentioned on Raw last night. If anybody didn't hear it, there's a bit of a detailed look at what Cody Gakpo could offer us in the coming years rather than the coming weeks. And I can't even remember what the other piece I said was. Uh, oh, I look at the bottom half of the Premier League, basically. It's very, very concertina down there, and lots of sides could do good stuff or terrible stuff in the space of about two weeks, basically, uh, which is probably going to shape transfer markets and managerial markets across the last two weeks of January. And last thoughts before we go. Cristiano Ronaldo has signed for Saudi Arabian club Al Nazir. Carl Matchett, is this is this a, a fitting end to his career or is this an embarrassing end to his career? I don't follow the minor league, sorry. <laughs> the best part of it is all the Cristiano perverts who will now have to watch the Saudi Arabian League and try and pretend it's a it's a good level. Uh, he signed there till 2025. This is in all likelihood the last we'll see of him. And if you're the new manager of Portugal, this is a really good reason to not pick him now. He's not playing in a good league. You don't want him anymore. Finished. We'll leave it there. I'll see you tomorrow. Not tomorrow. We'll see you on... Tuesday, Wednesday, Sunday. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement, and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds and it means the world to the people who create these free shows.